Yes, everybody. Hello and welcome back to Tent 1. Our event here will be a bit interesting. It's uh, LGBTI plus um, art, expression and human rights. Um, it is possible to ask questions during this uh, event. It is, however, possible that we won't have time in the end. But please, on Twitter, use the hashtag artist, uh, no artistic rights. It will also be shown later in the PowerPoints for those who need to see it spelled out. You can also, on the live stream, use the question box we have to send in the questions. Yes, Paige, will you take it from here? Yes, thank you so much, Casper. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody on the live stream and all of you people here in this room. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Paige, we are Free Muse, and we're delighted to be here today. As Casper already mentioned, our session is on LGBTQI art, artistic freedom, and human rights. We have a wonderful panel discussion, we have an artistic performance, and we have a presentation of the key findings from an upcoming report of ours on LGBTQI expressions and human rights. So I'll hand it over to my colleague, our Free Muse Communications Manager, Emily, and she'll give an overview. Thank you so much, Paige. Good afternoon, and a big thank you to everybody joining us here and online. My name is Emily Del Terrio, and I'm the Communications Manager at Free Muse. Welcome to the session, LGBTI Art, Expression, and Human Rights. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we do at Free Muse, explain the link between human rights and artistic freedom, and talk about the situation for LGBTI artists and art. In the latter, the situation has been measured through the documentation of violations of artistic freedom which explicitly target LGBTI people or LGBTI-themed art and expression. This research has been collated into the flagship report, The Risk of Visibility, LGBTI Artistry and Art, and today you will get the first look at these research findings. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Sorry, guys. Hang on one moment. Thank you. I'm going to talk about these protections, sorry, and what Free Muse's role is in defending these rights, some tools that we use, and how these all intersect with the LGBTI community and art. So, for some context, in 2019, Free Muse recorded 711 violations or breaches to the right of freedom of artistic expression. So, what is freedom of artistic expression and what constitutes a breach of this right? Well, Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights dictates, at least in part, that everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community and enjoy the arts. Artistic freedom, the freedom to participate, enjoy, create, share and seek profit from artistry is protected under human rights, foundational human rights documents and covenants. Interference with these rights and many others motivated by any number of factors is what we consider to be a breach of the right to freedom of artistic expression. So what does this look like in real terms for real people like you and I? Well, it's the arrest of 75 people on charges of inciting immorality at a Cairo concert of Masha Leila, an indie rock band whose lead singer is an openly gay LGBTI ally. They were arrested for waving a rainbow flag. People are also protected under Article 19 of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, whereby each person is entitled to exercise their right to freedom of expression association and assembly. It's the removal of this Lady Gaga quote from the sign at the front of the University of Central Arkansas Library in celebration of pride as, among other reasons, the university president stated that they had to be very mindful of the hundreds of minors that would be on campus during the summer. All people are entitled to equality and non-discrimination as a basic principle of international human rights law and as such, they are protected by these same laws. At Free Muse, we champion artistic freedom from a number of fronts. From a research front, we document violations of artistic freedom throughout the year, monitoring the media and building relationships with organisations across the world to source, document and verify these violations. 
This research is then leveraged towards evidence-based advocacy for the better protection of the right to freedom of artistic expression. We work with artists, art and cultural organisations, activists in the global south and north to campaign for and support individual artists with a specific focus on those targeted for their gender, race or sexual orientation. Whilst doing this, sorry, we do this whilst initiating, supporting and growing locally owned networks. This year, we have focused our efforts into a number of areas, one of them being educating people on their rights. And with that, I want to ask you a question. Do you know your artistic rights? When we posed this question to a room full of people in relation to their rights online recently, the response was an alarming and resounding no. Many people still do not know that the removal of their art online, one of the only public spaces most of us have access to during this pandemic, may constitute a breach of their right to freedom of expression. Or that death threats from trolls for posting art that challenges political or social norms could likely be a breach of Article 3 of the UDHR. Everyone has the, the right to live, to be free and to feel safe. In July this year, Free Muse uh, launched a campaign, Know Your Artistic Rights. The first phase of the campaign has been to focus on artistic rights online by raising awareness with artists that they have digital rights and remedies to violations, artists are given back control and can keep themselves safe with a range of tools. So the first step has been to develop this open source digital toolkit, guided by and used to guide artists around the world. Next step will include making sure these tools respond, address uh, the specific needs of targeted people and their works, including LGBTI artists and their expressions. Because when it comes to LGBTI artists and art, our research is extremely finite. Artists are alarmingly discriminated against because of their actual or perceived sexual orientation and gender identity. LGBTI artistic endeavors have been marginalized globally. Consensual same-sex intercourse has been criminalized in many countries during the 20th century through various legal practices. This is further instilled even where legal practices have been dissolved by social practices and adherence to specific heteronormative social norms. LGBTI art is commonly perceived through the prism of the sexual orientation or gender identity of its author and categorized as queer content. In this way, it has been distinguished from what is understood as mainstream art. Artists tackling LGBTI issues face disproportionate repercussions because of their work. These efforts to silence LGBTI-related artistic expressions at the same time limit artists' ability to express themselves through art and impose undue restrictions on those wishing to access queer artworks. The risk of visibility, artistry and art no, nevertheless shows that artistic expression tackling LGBTI experiences exists in most countries, regardless of the political, legal or social hurdles. Despite efforts to the contrary, it clearly demonstrates that no laws, traditions or religions can entirely re eradicate artistic expression on these issues. Alarmingly, a lack of criminalisation has little impact on violations of artistic freedom for LGBTI persons and expressions. Of the 149 cases Freemuse documented for the report, 45% of the violations occurred in 19 countries and online where there is no law criminalising homosexuality or its promotion. In countries where this is criminalised, 55% of violations occurred in 20 countries and online. Additionally, 48% of violations occurred in 18 countries where positive depictions of homosexuality is banned. Government authorities were overwhelmingly responsible for these violations of artistic freedom, with over half of the documented cases perpetrated by governments. Film was recorded as the most targeted art form, with 34% of violations documented from the film industry. Films like Bohemian Rhapsody, which had two kissing scenes between men removed in China, as well as a reference to the word gay. As Chinese documentary filmmaker Fan Popo stated in his interview with Free Muse, the sentences may be cut only three minutes, but they made Freddie Mercury straight.
However, whilst we can roll our eyes at the outrageousness of some of these attempts to stifle LGBTI expression, the underlying motivation by those who wish to silence LGBTI artists to hide them from the public discourse and public lies can and has led to devastating violence. For the report, Free Muse documented one killing of an artist, three people who were imprisoned, 20 artists who experienced detention, the terrifying process of being held by authorities pre-trial. One artist was prosecuted, five artists were persecuted, nine artists were threatened or harassed, one artist was attacked, and LGBTI artists experienced 96 counts of censorship. These acts equate to a damning state of artistic freedom for people associated with LGBTI artistic expression. This is what drives us at Free Muse and the many people here today, activists, ally, artists, who stand for LGBTI people, who stand for queer art, and all those who wish to express themselves and their identity freely through art. Since the challenges imposed on LGBTI artists and queer art are multifaceted, they require joint efforts by international, regional and national stakeholders to overcome them, to create a space for LGBTI artists to openly exercise artistic freedoms and for audience to have unhindered access to queer art promoted in public spaces. And we do have an ask. Together with the community, with a network of LGBTI organisations, allies and artists, we urge governments to repeal criminalised homosexuality and laws banning positive, banning positive depictions of this, refrain from censoring LGBTI artistic expression in public space, protect audiences attending LGBTI cultural activities, make state-funded cultural institutions safe places for LGBTI artists and to invest in cultural projects tackling these issues. If you want to become a part of the community, join us at freemuse.org forward slash join dash us. Thank you for your time and thank you for your support. If you have any questions, please post them on Twitter using the hashtag no artistic rights. I'd like to welcome to the front Aztamat. Uh, please join me in welcoming him to reclaim some space for LGBTI artistic expression. Hello. So nice to be here. Um, so I'm just going to present to you uh, two of my um, tracks that were written uh, explicitly because of what's happening in Poland in terms of the LGBTI community. Um, they're not very happy, I know. It's pride and everybody wants to party, but, um, well, I'm going to ruin your moment for a second here. <laughs> in my bones but I just can't stop the feeling take me far away from you cause I'm not safe when defeated the TV's on but the kids still cry you wanna be clean but you still get high in my mouth but I just can't spit the flavor keep me far away from you cause I know that you'll be safer cause I know that you'll be safer cause I know
And you pull me in faster, faster And you're taking away from my mind And you pull me in deeper, deeper And you're taking away from my mind Faster Deeper, deeper Faster Deeper, deeper in my mouth but I just can't split the flavor keep me far away from you cause I know that you'll be safer and you pull me in faster faster and you take it away from my mind and you pull me in deeper deeper and you take Anybody see We've got a war to fight Never found a way Regardless of what they say How can it feel this strong? Moment. How can it be this strong? Storm in the morning light. I feel no more. Can I say? Frozen to myself I've got nobody on my side To show me it's not right I've got nobody on my side To show me it's not
Thank you so much for that wonderful performance. Um, I'm delighted to now announce our panel discussion. So if our panelists want to come and join us upon here. Okay, do we all have microphones and comfortable seats? Mm -hmm. We're uh, a little high with the tables here, so we have some seats in the background for us. Um, okay, so I'll delightfully introduce all of our panelists. Firstly, I'll go with um, our head on the screen is Sophia. Can you hear us, Sophia? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> um, can you try talking so we can? <laughs> Good, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you so much. So Sophia, she's based in the US right now. She's a lawyer, a digital rights fellow, and she's a legal assistant for the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Association. Um, here we have, um, I'll just go down the panel one by one. So we have Monica, who's flown in from Poland today. Um, she's a feminist, a rebel. She's a leader of the, um, a huge ally in the LGBTQI community. Maybe you want to just say a few words for yourself? Or? About myself? Yeah, you can just give a um, one word on... I didn't expect such question. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can just give, like, you don't have to, if you don't see So, I, I'm a motorcyclist. <laughs> That's I, enough. That's and, <laughs> and a human being and, um, and a loving person. And that's, that's all. Perfect. Thank you so much. Next is uh, Kachan, who we just had a wonderful DJ set from. Um, he's a musician, a curator, a producer. He works with a number of different associations and collectives also in Poland. Um, maybe Hi, so nice to be here. Uh, yeah, I'm, all the things that you've said, and uh, uh, I try to create safer spaces for queer communities in Poland. Perfect, thank you so much. And on the end, we have an MEP. We have Karen, Karen Melia. Um, she's based in Denmark and works um, in the European Parliament. And thank you very much for having me here, and thank you for having this debate. I am in the European Parliament now. I used to be a Danish diplomat, and I had the pleasure of spending three months in Warsaw uh, five years ago, so pre the previous election. And one of the things that I'm looking forward to seeing back in Warsaw is a reinstatement of fundamental rights, and also there's a beautiful rainbow that used to be on a square in Warsaw that has been taken away for so-called security reasons. I'm looking forward to seeing that back on the streets and coming to Warsaw Pride. Wonderful, thank you so much, Karen. Um, so in this panel discussion, we'll be asking each of the panelists a question, kind of tailoring to their expertise. And then hopefully, if we have some time at the end, we'll be able to have more of a dynamic interaction between them. This is a safe space, so if anybody feels uncomfortable at any point, please let a member of our team know, the Copenhagen Pride team or somebody from Free Muse, and we'll try our best to, to navigate that situation. Um, we are a little tight on time, as all panel discussions ever are, so um, we'll try and be succinct and clear, but um, if there's any issues or questions that you have, please send them to No Artistic Rights on Twitter, and if we don't have time to engage in them, we'll, we'll engage with you in a follow-up capacity. So the first question I would like to ask is Sophia on, on Zoom. Can we, can we, can we get her back, back up? Perfect, thank you so much. So um, Sophia, you work, as I mentioned, with the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, and has recently released a report on artistic freedom. So this looks at artistic freedom and the state of the situation around the globe. Um, in some sections, you've mentioned the state for LGBTQI artists and how religion and insulting religious feelings and hurting religious sentiments is often used as a guise 
that states um, silence and censor artists. Why do you think this is? Why do you, how have you seen this proliferation? And what kind of tools and skills do we need to, to kind of combat this in the future? Hi, everyone. First, thank you, Paige and Previous, for inviting me to this panel. I hope you can hear me right. Perfectly um, so clear. Yes, perfect. Um, so yes, uh, the Artistic Freedom Research Report uh, was drafted uh, as the last batch of reports from David K. as Special Rapporteur. He finished his mandate two weeks ago. Now I continue to work with him at the University of California in Irvine, and there's a new rapporteur, she's Irene Kent, she's fantastic. So this report, we produced it, uh, we drafted it just to provide artists and architects with basically a vocabulary on human rights law to frame their restrictions and to frame all the challenges that artists around the world are, are facing. And we hope they can use it, use some of this language, well, just to, to challenge those restrictions. It's, it's also kind of a, it's a reminder to governments and to private actors because we saw a lot of the restrictions are pay here come also from private companies, um, just about their contours of their obligations and responsibility of the law. Uh, what we explored, we explored the relationship between artistic expression and freedom of expression. Sophia, can, um, I, introduce, can I interrupt you for two seconds? Can you um, speak uh, closer to the microphone so we can hear you a little clearer, please? Maybe I, if I hold it like this, you can, is it better? Yeah, I think so, thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm from Colombia and Latina, I move a lot, so sorry about that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we try to explore the relation of artistic expression with freedom of expression, all its scope, all its restrictions. Um, uh, yeah, within, within this right, within freedom of expression, but we emphasize that it exists within a broader, like a, a broader framework of interconnected rights, like you mentioned before. Uh, including the rights of privacy, freedom of thought, functions, religion, just to, to name a few. We just we specified and we emphasize that the spectrum of artistic expression is very wide and very dynamic and like ever, exchange, ever expanding and, and changing. Um, so part of our analysis, um, we, we discovered, or not discovered, we just emphasized a lot of the a lot of the restrictions that you mentioned before when you were presenting your report, um, and especially because we relied heavily on, on, your, on your investigation, and we found that just governments narrow the boundaries of artistic expression to just restrictive legislation, ambiguous policies, vague regulations in general. And that creates a lot of like, the climate, a, a climate of fear, a climate of, um, that results in self-censorship. And I'm just mentioning this because it is part of the framework that we use, and we hope it, it's just, it, it is useful for the advocate, for different advocates. Um, and what we said is that just once the individual has shown that there's a restriction on expression, the burden falls on the state to demonstrate that it complies with their national human rights law. Um, there are specific, I, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the requirements when, there, when someone wants to restrict freedom of expression, but the state has to prove that. And going back to specifically what you asked, um, based on what we found, artistic expression is frequently prohibited by states when the artist deemed insulting to religions. Yeah. But also the special rapporteur on freedom of expression and the one on freedom of religions have emphasized that this right, the right to freedom of religion and belief, sometimes has been very misinterpreted, misperceived as protecting religion itself or a specific system of beliefs, when in fact it protects individuals holding or expressing those beliefs. That's, a, that's very different because some governments use uh, some like so-called like blasphemy laws just to protect those, those, the system of beliefs. There's another article besides the article that you mentioned before, the Article 19 of the ICCPR. There's another Article 20 that provides for restrictions with respect to hateful advocacy that amounts to incitement and hostility. And that article has also been, been a little bit misused. Um, this, I, this, it, this article uh, this is the, it provides restrictions uh, with respect to hateful advocacy 
uh, that amounts to incitement to hostility, discrimination, or violence. It does not allow just um, merely restrictions on the basis of like being incompatible, be incompatible with particular faith values. Nor it also allows any restrictions that amount to blasphemy as such. So this is what we found. We found that it, like some of the regulation used by states, it's just being since it's um, framed vague, broad, like it's being abused just because it doesn't it doesn't allow people to just to to model their their actions accordingly. It's so big that they can use it and abuse it uh, as they want, whether it's government officials or or just like law enforcement in general. And I know we don't have a lot of time, but we also found a lot of different discriminatory treatment um, in, uh, in the application of the law. We tried to frame this as like using a general principle of, of law that's just like uh, freedom of opinion and expression and basically all the rights must be respect respected without a distinction of any kind. This is a very broad, very, um, it, it, it permeates all the legal systems and all the international human rights law. And we saw that members of some groups and especially members of the LGBTQ community often fa face particular re discrimination when it comes to just in the implementations and restrictions on, of, of, exp of expression. And this, this type of art, any type of art that has for queer content, it's been restricted just because it exists, not, not alleging any particularly challenge to state authority or any public outcry. And I'm, I'm just mentioning this because this is just some of the other foundings that we that we try to express in, in our report. Hopefully, uh, you can use the report to just to frame the challenges and to frame the restrictions. I don't know if I have a lot more time, but thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia. That was wonderful to kind of get the, the political and legal aspect from, from that level. I'd like to bring Katyan in on this. So as Sophia was mentioning, the use of blasphemy and the misuse of religious rationales has been, it's proliferating across the globe and in one country where that's specifically endemic is in Poland. So it'd be great to hear from you on how your, have you had experiences with this censorship based on religious rationales and what's the situation for LGBTQI artists and creatives in Poland? Um, the situation is pretty hairy to say the least. Um, we've had, um, We've had people being persecuted for for this so-called insulting uh, of the religious um, feelings, which is somehow a concept that completely flies over my head. Um, uh, there, there have been artists who have been using um, um, Christian symbol symbolics in their work, and they have been uh, persecuted for that. Um, so. Yeah, and also there's th there's a lot of uh, censorship going, especially with content that, that comes uh, from the West. For example, we also had, uh, uh, lately we had this famous um, um, thing happen that uh, there was this kids animation uh, from Pixar, I think, and they had um, two uh, girlfriends and uh, the the translator somehow changed that to make them into only friends um, so that kids in Poland don't have the right I guess to to know that there's people like them in uh, you know all walks of life uh, and the thing is this wasn't even govern governmentally sanctioned and it, it was uh, just made out of fear that uh, oh this is you know this is going too far showing kids to girls who love each other, you know. Um, so, but I guess we have been we have been pretty um, uh, used to working underground and working in uh, places that are less visible, um, creating surf safer spaces for ourselves um, without the help of the government, without the funding. Um, so everything 
that's going on right now is pretty DIY and people just do it uh, in their free time and pay out of pocket and um, so yeah uh, I mean paradoxically it has strengthened our community because it's it's made us um, vulnerable so we're kind of rallying um, around each other to to support ourselves and and to and if there's like any kind of legal action taking uh, taken uh, against artists, then we do um, charity events and um, and uh, some kind of uh, an online um, online events to to get the money for their legislative uh, costs and and everything. <laughs> I'm kind of going off on a tangent here. <laughs> no, it's great. It's good to <laughs> learn about it. And how about the, the work that you're doing with the associations and the collectives that you're involved in? Could you repeat? And the work that you're uh -huh. doing with your collectives and the uh -huh. associations, how does that kind of align with the DIY element of what mm -hmm. you were just expressing? Uh, both of the collectives that I'm part of, uh, Oramix and Cieszki Brokat, which, is, which uh, translates to heavy glitter, are uh, um, collectives that have been built from the ground up and they're like very much grassroots movements. Um, so, so yeah, we have never really relied on any funding or any organizational help from, from anyone. Um, and of course, it's been hard. It's been, it's been a lot of work. There's sometimes months that um, you don't have one free day in, in, uh, you know, to, to unwind. And, and uh, for yourself, but then um, in the end, when things like two weeks ago start happening, you, you say to yourself, uh, just as Monica said today to us, if I'm not gonna do it, then who else is gonna do it? You know, if I don't create this space for these kids who just want to know that they're not alone, that, that they're not this kind of like singular freak, uh, just like uh, living apart from the whole society and, and being like ostracized, uh, then who is gonna do it? You know, no, no one, no one uh, has the resources, no one has the know-how. So we're kind of like, um, you know, winging it as we go, I guess. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we have amazing support from the community, which, is, which, which helps a lot. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much for thank sharing you. that. So to take it from you mentioned resources and the grassroots level. So to take that to the, the European Parliament, which has significantly more resources, you could say, than uh, the DIY collectives in uh, Polish cities. Um, Karen, how do, you, how do you feel like the European Union has been interpreting this rise in populist governments and movements, silencing artistic expression and LGBTQI communities um, on the grounds of religion, on the grounds of nudi uh, nudism and uh, all of these different relationships with sexual content. How has that kind of entered the policy vernacular at the European Union and how do you think maybe that can be improved going forward? Well, it's as, as you mentioned during your performance, uh, we're at a, we have a water fight uh, because if we don't dig in and defend the rights that we have now, then there is going to be a push to try and remove those rights. And I think one of, the, one of the really important things that we can do from the European community and from the European Parliament is to let people know in places like Poland, activists and artists, that you do have somebody by your side and that we are fighting this fight together with you when you're not alone, even though you have a government that is trying to push back and push you underground. For me, it's it's a fight that's not only in the countries that have legislation banning artistic expression with queer content, but it's also in places such as in Denmark. Uh, for the first time this year, the national parliament is going to fly the pride flag on Saturday when the parade was gonna be there. And the right wing part, the main right wing party said that this is terrible, this is a political expression that we should only fly the national flag from our national parliament. And it's sort of like you go, there is a scale of things where you, you first say, well, you can't be you, you can't be you with your identity and your sexuality. And then you say, well, you can be you, but you, you shouldn't flaunt it. You shouldn't show it, you shouldn't brag about it because your identity is dangerous either for the public or for children. But if you can't be visible, if you can't show you, the full you, is that actually, um, you want me to close the laptop, yes. If you can't be visible, if you can't be you as you are, 
then do you actually have the right to be you? And I don't think you do, because we need to be able to go to work, we need to be able to show our art, no matter if there is LGBTI content in it or if the artist is an LGBTI person. And I think this is sort of the, the front line of the war that we're at at the moment. And I think it's important that we at the European Parliament keep a focus on this and that we raise it in dialogue with countries around the world as well as countries uh, within the European Union. There is a case of um, six cities in Poland that had applied to be twinned with other European cities that were told by the European, Pol uh, the European Commission that you can't get EU funding if you don't respect fundamental rights in your city. These cities had made these this hateful initiative of having so-called LGBTI free zones, which basically tells people that you're not welcome in this city uh, because of who you are, and that this is of course a breach of fundamental rights um, and has to have consequences. So we need to say, well, we will not be supporting cities, regions, countries that don't respect fundamental rights. And when we're looking at the European budget, we need to say, okay, we have these principles and we need to let the money follow the principles on this. But it's, it's not just a political legislative fight, it's also uh, a fight of values. And for me, it's really important that we maintain that the European Union is not just a community of a market, but it's also a community of values. And respecting each individual and their rights uh, is fundamental to these values. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. Just to bring you in, Monica, on this fight for values and a kind of incorporation of queer content, which um, Karen, Kaitan, and Sophia have all mentioned. Do you think, so, so what we've been able to identify over the last few years is this significant distinguishing between mainstream content and, and queer content. And in some capacities, this is helpful. It can provide additional funding. It can provide um, visibility and respect. But in certain elements and in countries where there is a severe restriction on LGBTQI um, communities and expressions, this distinguishing between mainstream content and queer content is used to silence. So how do you feel like in, in your experience as an artist, uh, as an author, and also in so many queer spaces in Poland, how do you feel like this, do you think is a helpful distinguishing? And, and if so, or if not, what would you feel like can bridge that gap? Epic choice. Well, um, queer, queer culture, queer art in Poland, first of all, is very small and narrow part of the culture. And um, because of the fear to be um, the authors, artists, are afraid to be recognized. Some of them, we know that they are um, queer people, but they do not show it in public uh, because of the fear of losing contracts, fans, and so on. Uh, so adding to the censorship we've been mentioning before, we also have self-censorship. And uh, those authors and artists who are courageous enough to be themselves in this artistic um, space are not many. So um, in Poland, which is a especially diffi difficult situation right now, I think it would be best to mix up uh, queer culture, queer artists and queer themed art into mainstream art, because we are in a completely different situation than civilized world, uh, where queer culture is just a part of the culture, uh, which has its fans, doesn't have to be queer people, and helps this, this, this uh, division, this distinguishing this, this between queer and straight culture, helps only, you know, to find art you are interested about. But we are in a state of war. We are in a state of partisan fight for our fundamental rights. So a lot of this is, uh, a, lot of, a lot of what queer people are creating is a part of this fight. Uh, like, you know, hammering the weapons. Uh, first of all, to show the rest of the society that we are in the first place. 
because we are on this level now to showing that we are and to show that we are the same human beings as everybody else and that we do not love differently, we love the same way. And what is society doing to us uh, is causing terrible pain and um, breaks uh, biographies, breaks lives. Um, so that's why um, I think in Poland, sorry for being you know, so focused on my own ba uh, backyard, um, but I'm deep in a trench of this war right now, um, is that, uh, here, uh, that in Poland we try to verify, very hard we are trying to get to the mainstream media even, because mostly queer art, maybe except of some uh, books, um, it's only uh, perceived by queer people, like we are standing in, inside of our own uh, circle and uh, now we need to go out uh, to the public space, to the common space. Mm, we are trying to do this, of course. Uh, last month we had a uh, very interesting, even in Szczecin, when we um, created uh, our society in Szczecin, we created the mural uh, showing the um, uh, quotations of love letters between two men. One of them, most of most, one of them, Jarosław Iwaszkiewicz, most prominent, one of most prominent authors of 20th century in Poland, and uh, it was shown in a form of. Uh, mm, internet chat between those two people, uh, this uh, author and his lover. And this uh, painting on the wall in the center of Szczecin survived only two days and it was vandalized in the night. But of course we expected that it can happen. Uh, but uh, what was most important, uh, this Mm, painting was not operating with the symbols like rainbow and uh, other stuff. It, w it needed to be written carefully to understand that it is about the love of two men. And uh, that's the way we wanted to express that queer people existed and still exist and we are contributing to the common culture because it doesn't define us. Um, on some level, yes, because that's a question of identity. What, what is most important of my identity? And the conclusion was that we are humans and this is all of us as humans and this is the thing. Um, and the, the guys who didn't want this message to go to the society, they just spread a paint all, all over this uh, painting. Uh, Yes, we expected them to maybe, because we expected that one day somebody will do something about this, like paint some vul vulgarity on it, uh, like faggots, fuck off, which we hear all every, day, every day in the street. But it wasn't the, 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 the point. They painted it very carefully, so they wanted to wipe it off, to wipe this message. We are part of the society, we are part of our common world. So that's why um, I think uh, this is the way to uh, fill this gap uh, because we need to get to uh, society first, that to show us as a human beings in a normal uh, environment. And maybe, maybe that's the way, maybe that will help. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, we, are, we have 10 minutes left of this session, so I'm eager to open the, the floor up for questions. We have a number of questions that have come through on our Twitter, but um, I think we can also open for questions on the floor if anybody, if anybody has a question. You can just raise your hand and we can, we can bring you a microphone. Uh, yes, my question would be to Karen. Uh, what do you think, what instrument has the LGBTI uh, intergroup uh, in order to tackle the problems, for example, in Poland, 
and uh, human rights violations. Uh, the LGBTI intergroup is a cross-party, cross-political group in the European Parliament that works on ensuring fundamental rights for all in Europe. Uh, what it serves as for me is a way of connecting with other parliamentarians that are fighting the same fight and that are allies. And I think it's really important for highlighting when there are either good developments or bad developments so that we can react in unison. Um, this is a way of, of unifying forces within the European Parliament so that we can act together. I think we are, uh, French parliamentarian Pierre Kalskin is writing a letter uh, protesting the arrest of 148 uh, act LGBTI activists in Poland. We, they also organize visits to the European Parliament uh, by activists and highlight, um, highlight what's going on and also arranges conferences and seminars. I think it's a really useful tool for sort of using it as a megaphone for us in the European Parliament to highlight these, uh, these questions. Thank you, Karen. Maybe we can also ask Sophia a similar question if, if she can uh, put her on, on the screen. Sophia, um, can I uh, ask the same question to you, but in the UN capacity? So what instruments do you think are important in the UN um, environment and which mechanisms do you think are helpful to protect and defend LGBTQI um, expressions and artistic freedom? I think I've heard half the question you want to, but um, well, there are different instruments, like where I work, it's the special procedure branch of the UN, and there's a special rapporteur on the SOGI and, and sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, he is a great advocate and he has done a lot of, of different reports of different and his approach is very expansive uh, of the protection of, of LGBTQI rights. Um, but uh, I, I don't know, maybe it might be interesting to read also other reports and other, and other um, analysis from rapporteurs from rapporteur on, on rights to culture. Um, and freedom on the on us, the one freedom of expression. Um, maybe that was part of the question, like, um, but I'm not sure. I think it does. Yeah, that's absolutely wonderful. Do we have any more um, questions on the floor, or can we we can take one from we can take one from the internet? <laughs> so perhaps to Katiana and Monica about your detentions or any arrests that you, the two of you been involved in, how has that impacted self-censorship? So both of you mentioned in different capacities, self-censorship. How have the, how's the discrimination and the censorship and silencing contributed to any self-censorship um, that might have happened? Um, to be honest, it really made me want to scream even louder. <laughs> um, it, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's a really bad decision on the part of, of the policemen to to just start arresting people like willy-nilly uh, you know they there were like seriously there were like kids arrested who are just like standing next to the monument of Nicholas Copernicus who are just uh, who are just like taking taking selfies with the monument and they were arrested because they were in the vicinity of a rainbow flag you know which is like completely preposterous but it's it's how bad things have gotten in Poland um I think I think it's it's gonna make people more, more galvanized to to fight for our rights um, but also the, the the arrests have been I think very um, carefully calculated because it kind of results in this like freezing effect it tells you we're gonna arrest you if you're anywhere near a rainbow flag or anywhere near a rainbow protest, you know? Uh, so don't go on, don't, don't go to the streets, don't protest, stop your, you know, your yelling and everything like that. Uh, so um, if I was like 20 and got arrested next to a rainbow monument, I would think like 10 times before I went to a, you know, to an LGBT rally or even to a pride so, so uh, they're just trying to scare us right back into the closet. 
I uh, put the hope in uh, Polish uh, activists. Of course, as you said, it has uh, freezing um, effect on some people and scaring on other. I heard a lot of voices like, okay, this is it. I'm moving abroad. N n I don't do anything anymore. But I hope that will, there will be much more others who in this situation get motivated to fight. Uh, we Polish people are really good in, uh, you know, um, f in fighting for freedom. Uh, sh history shows that this is maybe the only talent we have. Uh, <laughs> we are not good builders, but we are good fighters. <laughs> so um, it, it was also my story because I became activist, uh, um, LGBTI activist, only after uh, this populist party came to power. So I hope uh, we'll just hold the ground and we will be still standing. Me personally, if, if they want to come, they know where I live and uh, they can do it, either the police or just the Nazis and uh, I'm not afraid of them because you know, they can beat me, they can arrest me, they can put me into the trial. Um, I survived all these things and uh, Nothing breaks like a heart, and none of them will break my heart. So, I'm not afraid of them. I think Karen wants to... Yeah, no, I have a, a short question to Katja and uh, Monica. What, I mean, I have certain tools such as the LGBTI Inter group. What, can, what do you want us to do from the European Parliament to support you in Poland? Um, can I just interject and say we have two minutes left? Um, maybe you can, we can touch upon it and then we can engage um, after the session in, in more. Okay, as shortly as I can. The uh, voters of Law and Justice, this ruling party in Poland, choose the party they follow mostly, as the survey revealed, because they expect a better financial situation for themselves. Not values, not other things, better financial situation. So, Law and Justice Party doesn't understand human rights, but uh, they will understand the language of money because their voters expect them money. Yeah? So, cut as much as you can. That's the only way, I think. Thanks. Follow the money. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think we have one minute left, so um, if there are any topics that you feel haven't been covered or you'd like more explanations on, on the issue of LGBTQI artistic expression, um, LGBTQI community, our upcoming report which will be launched in the, in the coming months, please do uh, grab us, one of us after the session or you can also go to freemuse.org and head over to the Global Action Network tab. You can tweet us at No Artistic Rights and we'll be following up any communication from this session. So feel free to, to drop as many messages as you want and we'll, we'll be in touch. But um, thank you so much to our wonderful panel here and Sophia on, on Skype or Zoom or on the internet. And thank you everybody for being here today. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much. A little service info. Uh, unfortunately, we had a little bit of a technical difficulty at the beginning, so some of the slides weren't shown. I have been promised that if you contact Freemuse, they will actually share the slides with you. So should you be interested in some of the data or just seeing some of the slides uh, to the presentation, you can get them there. Thank you. <laughs>